This video introduces deterministic finite automata, including what they do, what they are, and how they operate. The deterministic finite automaton, or DFA, provides our first and simplest model of machine computation. Let sigma be a finite alphabet. From the outside, what a DFA over sigma does is as follows. It takes as input any string in sigma star, and depending on the string it's given, it outputs either accept or reject. Thus, the deterministic finite automaton can be considered to answer some specific yes-no question about those strings, or equivalently, to define a set of strings accepted by the DFA. In the rest of this video, we'll introduce all the basic elements of what a deterministic finite automaton is and present the details of how it operates on each input string. So what are the details of what a DFA consists of? Suppose that our alphabet is sigma containing the symbol 0 and 1. We can represent a DFA by what is, in essence, an edge-labeled directed graph, with vertices and edges each playing a specific role. Our graph has a finite number of vertices, which we think of as states. We'll see that these states work as a sort of memory for the DFA, via which it can keep track of what's currently going on in the computation it's performing, literally the state of the computation. Among these states must be a unique start state, which we indicate with an arrow or loose unlabeled edge coming into it. This loose edge is the only part of our diagram that keeps it from being an actual graph. Our example DFA has three states, but any positive number of states is possible. We sometimes label the states of a DFA in order to refer to them or to record them in a set or table. But those state labels have no significance whatsoever in the operation of the DFA. They just help us to refer to the states or describe the roles those states play. Our graph also has a finite number of edges, which we think of as transitions between states of the DFA. Each one is labeled with some symbol from the alphabet sigma. Loop edges from a state back to itself are allowed. The rule for transitions is fairly straightforward. Each state must have exactly one outgoing transition for each symbol of sigma. The purpose of this rule will be clear once we discuss how a DFA operates. Let's go through the transitions of our example DFA. From the start state, we make a loop back to the start state on the symbol 0, and move down to the state at the right on the symbol 1. From the state at the right, we loop back to this state on the symbol 1, and we move to the bottom state on the symbol 0. And from the bottom state, we loop back to the bottom state on both a 0 and a 1. Finally, we designate some subset of the states as accept states. We'll indicate these by circling them. For our example, let's choose the top two states. Note that we can select any subset we'd like of the states to be accept states. We could even select all of them, or none of them, but such DFAs aren't very interesting. What we see is a complete deterministic finite automaton. Some finite number of states, including a unique start state, indicated by a loose incoming edge. One transition from each state, for each symbol of our alphabet sigma, and some subset of the states marked as accept states. Now, given an input string x, how does this DFA operate? The answer is quite simple and intuitive. We'll illustrate with the input 00111. We start unsurprisingly at the start state. Let's mark our current state in blue. Now we read the symbols of our input string, one symbol at a time, from left to right. Each one tells us which transition to follow from our current state. The first zero returns us to the start state, as does the second zero. The first one takes us to the state at the right, and the two subsequent ones return us to that state. Now that we've reached the end of our string, we look at the state we've landed at. If it's marked as an accept state, our DFA accepts the string. If not, our DFA rejects the string. In this case, we finish on an accept state, so this DFA accepts the string 00111. In this way, each input string sends us on a walk around our DFA, from the start state to some final state and that final state determines whether or not the string is accepted. How about the string 00110? Again, we start at the start state. The two zeros both send us back to the start state. The first one sends us to the state at the right, and the second one keeps us there. Finally, the last zero sends us to the bottom state. This state is not an accept state, so our DFA rejects the string 00110. Our DFA can be run similarly on any string over sigma. Each one will be either accepted or rejected. As one last example, the empty string epsilon is a string over sigma. 
we can run the DFA on it as well. We start at the start state, and we've already run out of symbols in our input string, so that's where we finish. The start state in this DFA is an accept state, so this DFA accepts the empty string. In general, for a given input string x to a DFA, start at the start state, follow the transition given by each symbol of x in sequence, accept if you finish in an accept state, and reject otherwise. Those are all the basics about DFAs. We've seen how they're constructed and how they operate. We'll have a great deal more to say about DFAs, so keep in mind for the future the big picture of what a DFA over sigma does. It acts as a function that maps each input string in sigma star to either accept or reject, which we can think of as green or red, or yes or no. Let's analyze the behavior of our example DFA and try to attach some meaning to each of its three states so that we can try to understand what question this particular DFA is answering and what set of strings it accepts. Starting with the top state. This is our start state, so the empty string lands us here. What other strings send us to this state? We can see that a 1 sends us to the state at the right, and there's no way to get back to the start state from there. On the other hand, we can see as many zeros as we like, and we'll continue to land back at the start state. The net effect is that the start state is where we land for input strings that contain no ones. In other words, the strings consisting entirely of zeros, which is the meaning we can attach to this state. All zeros. As a set of strings, the set 0 to n, where n is greater than or equal to 0. How about the state at the right? To land there, we see some non negative number of zeros at the start, then at least one 1 to get us to this state. Additional ones will keep us at this state while a zero will move us to the bottom state, from which there's no return. The net effect is that the strings landing us on the state at the right are exactly those formed by some non-negative number of zeros followed by some positive number of ones, but with no zeros after those ones. This gives us a meaning to attach to the state at the right. All zeros fall by at least one one. As a set of strings, the set zero to the n, one to the m, where n is greater than or equal to zero, and m is greater than zero. The bottom state must correspond to every remaining string. Any non-negative number of zeros and then a positive number of ones to get us to the state at the right, followed by a zero to move us to the bottom state. Once there, every transition from the bottom state returns us to the bottom state. So this is a sink state, like a black hole. Once in this state, there's no way out no matter what symbol comes after that zero. What actually characterizes a string that lands us on this state is that it has at least one 1 to get us to the state at the right, then a subsequent 0 to move us to the bottom state. So we could think of this state as coming from every string in which a 0 follows a 1, as a set of strings x, the symbol 1, y, the symbol 0, z, where x, y, and z are any strings in sigma star. There are other, perhaps simpler ways to express this set of strings, but this will do. Now that we have a sense of what each state means, let's look at the accept states the start state and the one at the right. The state at the right is where we land for any string of the form 0 to the n, 1 to the m, for n greater than or equal to 0, and m strictly greater than 0. And the start state is where we land for any string of the form 0 to the n, for n greater than or equal to 0. This would be exactly the case m equals 0 for the node at the right. Thus, we could combine these two descriptions, merging m greater than 0 and m equals 0 into m greater than or equal to 0. We can conclude that our DFA accepts exclusively strings of the form 0 to the n, 1 to the m, with m and n greater than or equal to 0. That is, some non negative number of zeros followed by some non negative number of ones. In describing this DFA, we've already seen sets of strings come into play, which are next in our agenda. Equivalently, recall we can think of this DFA as answering a yes no question about the string it's given. Does this string consist of some non negative number of zeros? followed by some non-negative number of ones? Or alternatively, does this string not have a zero after any one? Our DFA accepts strings for which the answer is yes, and rejects those for which the answer is no. That's it for this brief introduction to deterministic finite automata. We've seen how a DFA is constructed, how it runs, and that each DFA accepts some set of strings, or alternatively, answers some yes-no question about strings. We'll come back to DFAs soon after we work a bit more with sets of strings, which is coming up next.